Last year, I published this book, The Sarcophagus of Identity. Part of the reason for that was that I had found in my own personal experience what a prison identity can be. And what I worry about very much is the way in which national identity is tied to the projects of the state, right? especially projects around war. Um, the most interesting right, it's okay. The most interesting piece on all of this is a book by a person who was born in Lebanon, Amin Malouf. He's a Christian, one of those small Christian sects that still um, lives in the Middle East. Um, what Malouf argued was that identity was a false friend. Um, he also said that our task is to develop the awareness that our words are not innocent in our construction of the other, nor, I would add, in our own self-construction in the project of creating an identity for ourselves. Malu further suggests that identity starts with a perfectly permissible aspiration. And before we know it, we are, it has become an instrument of war. We are denouncing an injustice. We are defending the rights of a suffering people. Then the next day, we find ourselves accomplices in a massacre. He goes on and directly connects massacres, like most of the bloody wars, as he says, to complex and long-standing cases of identity. And I would add some of the heritage stories that help to engender such identities. Nothing else exists, Malouf adds, except quote, them and us, the insult and the atonement. We are necessarily, and by definition, innocent victims. They are necessarily guilty and have long been so, regardless of what they may be enduring at present. Thus, Malouf writes, it is often the way we look at other people that imprisons them within their own narrowest allegiances. It is also the way we look at them that may, in the end, set them free. He is criticizing our tendency to lump the same people together under the same heading. For example, when we say that the Serbs have massacred, the English have devastated, or the Jews have confiscated, etc. I had the experience of teaching for five years at the University of Ulster in that little province called Northern Ireland. I got a real sense of what sectarian identities are like and what can happen as a result. One of the things that's very clear to me, and we should all watch this with some care, is that Brexit may bring about a revival of the troubles in Northern Ireland. There is a very long essay by Susan Mackay in this morning's Guardian about what happens if a hard Brexit boundary border is put in place again. Peter Robinson, he must be channeling Donald Trump. Peter Robinson is, would like to have a, a wall of some sort all along the border. Absolute impossibility, of course. What you can bet is that at this very moment, there are dissident Republicans who will be planning, just in case, to kill anybody who is in place putting, manifesting a hard border. I was thinking about it myself this morning. I was thinking, <laughs> if I was driving a car across the border, I don't know if I'd stop. <laughs> right? If they tried to make me stop, I'd say, go ahead, shoot me. Hmm? I wouldn't do it. I can tell you. you know, I'm, a, I'm a peace person. <laughs> but, but I can see that some people will do that. And if somebody raises a gun towards them, 
They'll shoot first. You can bet on it. Those identities are so deeply held that the peace process has made them settle. But the peace process is now under serious threat. And we should be very attentive to what happens in the next few weeks. Um, I, used to, I had a student while I was teaching at the University of Ulster's campus in the city called Derry. You know where I'm going with this. One doesn't, in my family, one doesn't respond to it as London Derry, okay? Uh, uh, and one of the things that happened during the peace process of the last 20 years is that that divide was bridged. And it was bridged not only by the physical peace bridge that was built, but also by the way in which people came to understand that the city really had two histories, two bits of heritage. And so in its winning the uh, UK City of Culture for 2012, the city re branded itself as Derry, London Derry. It was very clever. Some Republicans didn't like it in the least. And they're the ones I worry about. When I taught at, um, at uh, the University of Ulster, it was very interesting to me. I, I had one student who was a fierce Republican. And as you would say in those parts, not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Um, he was a bit um, slow, but he was a vehement Republican. And it was very, I used to ask him, I said, now, Joe, now, <laughs> um, we all came out of the Rift Valley, as best we know, in what's now Kenya, about 50, 70,000 years ago, something like that. When did the Irish become Irish? Right? Um, it used to really throw him. Right? Um, so, I'm gonna, as I said, let me, let me give you another example that worries me a great deal, and that's um, the American South. Um, the oppression inherent in the categories engendered through language was compelling, compellingly apparent to me one evening about 15 years ago when I met a man who, over the next several hours, told me about his life. He had been born Larry Michael Armstrong on the 30th of July, 1949, in the whites only section of the Catholic Hospital in racially segregated Jackson, Mississippi. Larry's mother was a strawberry blonde named Ann Armstrong, who was the wife of Fred Armstrong, a local cafe owner. The afternoon following his birth, his mother instructed the nurse to fill out the birth certificate, which provided the basic facts of little Larry's identity. On the line for father, Fred Armstrong was written. And although the nurse apparently hesitated somewhat, she wrote white on the line that indicated Larry's race. Larry Armstrong, of course, had neither the choice to accept or reject how he was defined by others, or to question the category stream, scheme that had been imposed on the southern states of the United States which privileged the fair-skinned and discriminated in horrific ways, including lynching, against those whose skin tone was darker. As Larry would slowly learn, the category by which he would be ultimately defined was nigger. He remembered those times as a small child when the man he thought of as his father would come home, beat his mother, and berate her, shouting, take the nigger baby and get out. He also remembered the rock thrown by another boy that hit him above the eye, along with taunts such as, we don't play with no niggers. When he was six years old and preparing, he thought, for first grade at the local primary school, Larry's parents made the fateful decision to send him away from Jackson, Mississippi. A local black woman, Mary Davis, whom Fred Armstrong knew, arranged to have Larry brought up by her childless daughter, Helen Spain and Helen's husband in Los Angeles. Almost overnight, absent his brother Charlie, 
his sister Lissy, his mother Anne, and her husband Fred, white Larry Armstrong of Jackson, Mississippi, became black Johnny Spain of Los Angeles, California, an only child in a most profound way. That Johnny Spain would subsequently become a petty thief, then a convicted murderer, and finally, one of the Soledad Six, the prison inmates in California's notorious Soledad prison, who many considered revolutionaries, should really not be a surprise given the foregoing account. What we should be attentive to, however, is that Johnny Spain ultimately liberated himself from the identities and social worlds that had been imposed upon him. He's lived as a free man now for 30 years in San Francisco. Lovely guy. He told me, by the way, that he and a couple of guys were just holding the men he was convicted of murdering. Hold, they were holding them up. He said, I had a gun and it, these were his exact words, it went off. Right? He wasn't intent on killing somebody. Right? Um, as I've noted in presentations I've made since living in Northern Ireland, the hatred of the negative other, be they Muslim, Jew, or Roma, is central to contemporary constructions of national identities in Europe and elsewhere. In Ireland, the problem is so well known that it even provides the basis for some humor about sectarianism. For example, a Jewish tourist um, is making his way about in the center of Belfast when he finds himself in the midst of a sectarian protest. The leaders of the protest query him, are you a Protestant or a Catholic? He replies, I'm neither. I'm Jewish. Great consternation among the leaders of the protest. But finally, one of the leaders asks, but are you a Protestant Jew or a Catholic Jew? <laughs> right? That's the way it, that is the way it worked. I have to tell you, um, <laughs> you know, the first thing that people want to know when they meet you is what your surname is. And the reason for that is very simple. That will indicate whether you're one of us or one of them, right? <laughs> and um, the other thing that you have to watch out for, it's so subtle. Do you aspirate the letter that comes after G in the English language alphabet? Is it H or is it H? If it's H, you're a Catholic. Right? Everyone knows it and everyone pays attention. You get dispensation if, like me, you were born in New York and you can always pull up a New York accent. Um, these sectarian identities are exa exacerbated, as uh, Michael Billig has noted, because the nation state is no longer able to impose a uniform sense of identity, because the nation state is being fatally assaulted from above and below by globalization, as we have seen here in Europe with the fissures caused by the assertions of multiple identities with multicultural states, etc., informed by what John Uri calls mobility. As you may know, the Prime Minister of Ireland is gay, right? This is, this is uh, not exactly well received in the North, uh, to say the least, and it's completely changed. The role that religion used to play in identity in Ireland and in much of Europe, if you've seen the latest data, is gone. Uh, you could never have elected a gay prime minister 20 years ago in Ireland. Absolutely impossible. Um, uh, today, that is uh, uh, not only possible, no one cares. And very soon, uh, when I go back to Ireland uh, at the end of May, there will be a referendum on abortion. And you can bet the right to abortion will be enshrined in law just as the right to life and not execution has been enshrined. Um, one of the things that uh, some scholars have noted is that the nation inevitably functions through the construction and enforcement of what is called, quote, a people, a national identity, which includes or subordinates, subordinates all those who are different. 
I knew the code when I was growing up a little boy in New York. When I was five years old, I knew who we were. And I knew who they were. And I knew the hierarchy of people. We weren't quite white. And I'll tell you, I was quite surprised <laughs> about 20 years ago, in one of those periods where you say it's kind of a life transition, I um, applied for a temporary one-year position at Goldsmith College in London. The British are really good at this, you know. They, they had an equal employment opportunity form that you had to fill out. Now, it said at the, you know, I would describe myself as, and then in parenthesis, check one. Okay? The first category was white, whatever that means, and nothing for those of us who get pink in the sun. Um, but <laughs> the rest of the categories, there were about 13 of them, were all remnants of the British Empire. So you had black Caribbean, black African, it went on, Pakistani, etc. right? The final category was Irish. <laughs> You know, they made fun of this in, in the, um, uh, the film of Roddy Doyle's novel, The Commitments, that some of you may have seen. Uh, if you have, it's a great delight. And, they, and as one of the band members says, the Irish are the blacks of Europe. So they must have taken their lead in the British bureaucracy uh, to, put, uh, to make sure that the distinction was clear. Not quite white, huh? Um, let me, let me pull out a couple of things that I, I want to... Uh, Billig is very good on this, and I think anybody involved in heritage and identity studies or work should be uh, concerned about their, uh, their form. Not only... Um, Billig, Billig talks about banal nationalism, and he suggests that everything is flagged to remind you of who you are, right? Um, I remember having students a couple of years ago and when I, was, I taught in America to have students go in the little town they were in and note the flagging of everyday events, right? So you could go in this little town to a, one of the few places you could get pizza and you got real American pizza, right? Um, and it always the flags, you know, just to remind you, right? Um, I, um, I would say that if you look at the way in which this is played out in terms of identity, you'll recognize why it is so easy to get people engaged in warfare. So one of the things that has concerned me over the years is, uh, what's the role of heritage then? Hmm. Um, uh, is it to support national identity? I think it's one of the, anybody working in the field, um, I think it's one of the things you must be concerned about, right? And you shouldn't, I would argue, not be hesitant to challenge that sensibility. I was very glad, for example, that you mentioned Alan Turing. Um, what, it, what strikes me uh, is that this is, these kinds of things are often left out. Um, the fundamental difficulty with asserting a European identity, it seems to me, uh, is that it tends to support some kind of incipient, embryonic identity tied to the European Union. If you look at the promulgation of reports and statements from Jean-Claude Juncker, you would be concerned. He wants full complementarity with NATO. Right? He wants to toughen up the European Union with its own military force. Right? There's a game being played, and one must be very, very aware of whether one is contributing to it or not. Another core problem, I think, with cultural heritage is one articulated by Edward Said in his book, Culture and Imperialism. In thinking about our common future on this planet, Said argues we must take account of the relentless commodification of everything. 
He goes on and says, we have rarely been so fragmented, so sharply reduced, and so completely diminished in our sense of what our true, as opposed to asserted, cultural identity is. One consequence, he argues, is, quote, a new relationship with the past based on pastiche and nostalgia. The struggle, therefore, is to fight against those who might turn cultural hi history into a Disneyland version of cultural history. When I go over to the castle here, do they really have a 15 minute video that says Madhyar on it? Hmm? Oh, it's in 3D. Oh, well, that's okay then. I mean, this is the kind of stuff we have to say no to. This is idiocy. Um, Finally, um, one of the things that occurs to me, um, I bought a couple of books. This is the book that I wrote. This is, we're in the middle of this. This is the sixth extinction, right? Right? Lots of species are just, forget it, whether it's bees, birds, whatever it is. We're next, <laughs> right? Um, and this is to give you a sense of what, for me, is one of the most horrific issues. This is by a good friend of mine, Dan Ellsberg. He was the one who released the American Pentagon Papers, The Secret History of the Vietnam War. This book is a result of something else he copied but only recently admitted. He copied 7,000 pages of The Secret History of the Vietnam War, known popularly as the Pentagon Papers. <laughs> he told a couple of us a few years ago, he said, they never asked me in my trial if I copied anything else. I was really glad, because I did. I copied 8,000 pages of the United States' nuclear war plans. That's this book, right? One of the, I mean, um, I wonder if cultural heritage shouldn't put stronger emphasis on what some of our colleagues in studying tourism or branding tourism, etc., call dark tourism, right? And shouldn't there be a dark cultural heritage as well? Um, uh, you know, shouldn't you go? You should go to Hiroshima, right? You should see what an atomic bomb can do. Right? And the, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima is nothing compared to what they have today. Hmm? Hmm. More than that. Three, and there are 3,000 held by the United States and 3,000 held by the Russians and, and a couple of other countries have them as well. Um, one of the things that Ellsberg talks about just to give you an example of why we need to look at this, is that at the Trinity drop on July 16, 1945, Enrico Fermi, who was one of the key actors in the development of the bomb and a mathematician of some, some uh, greatness, Enrico Fermi was taking bets. This is how mad our heritage is. Fermi was taking bets because a number of people thought that the heat from the bomb, which had never been experienced before, might ignite the nitrogen in the Earth's atmosphere and turn the Earth into a fireball. Fermi said, mm, only 10% chance. Now, 10% is a lot, and he had said exactly the same thing when he was asked if a new controlled nuclear chain reaction could be done several years before. I think we've got to worry. OK, uh, uh, let, me, let me say one other thing. One of the reasons I think um, that this dark cultural heritage should be attended to is what you're missing here. You need, I think, to see Kreuzstadl. Last night was the 73rd anniversary 
of when local people in the village of Recknitz, 15 kilometers from here, went to the barn where 200 Jews were being held and massacred them all. Why that isn't on your itineraries, I don't know. They'll have you go see the pretty castle at Lockenhaus, wonderful, beautiful place. You know, the bar's okay. Hmm? But they won't take you to Kreuzsattel. You might ask them if you, that you shouldn't follow a different itinerary when you go across the border. This is only 15 kilometers from here, and it's on the way to the wonderful Peace Castle in Schwetzlein. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much.